You know, we're to sing the truth as much as preach truth. That last song that we just sang, I wonder many times how many Christians, when they sing that, are singing truth or they're singing a lie. Because they've never done what that song said. They've never gotten to that point where, where it's none of self and all of thee. Uh, that love has never conquered them. Uh, and thus it is with a lot of brethren, it is just about all of self and none of God. Or that uh, stage of just a little bit of self, but a little bit more of God. But very seldom uh, do we actually progress to that none of self and all of thee. We need to be careful that we sing the truth as well as sing heartily, preach the truth. But those things that we sing need to be the truth and need to pay attention thus to what we sing because it's just as wrong to sing a lie as to speak a lie. And if you don't remember where all liars are going to be, uh, just read the last couple of chapters of Revelation and you'll find out. We are faced with differing circumstances of life. We all face different things within our life. There's, for example, we face criticism. How do we receive that criticism? We should, of course, be patient in criticism, listening to it, paying attention to it. Some of it justified, some of it not. If it justified, we ought to take the cr criticism and make corrections. We're given praise at times. Well, we need to be humble in accepting that praise. Uh, not allow it to become... Uh, Ego trip, not becoming egotistical because of the praise that we do receive. <clears throat> but likewise, we receive bad news at times, and we need to be self-controlled in that. Learn how to control ourselves and our emotions. Uh, we need to be hospitable in receiving guests. And you could go on and on in relationship to circumstances that we call all come under. But nothing really is more important than how we receive God's Word. And so in our lesson this morning, and Lord willing, next Sunday morning, I want us to notice about how we receive God's Word. And the very first point that we need to make in that is that we should receive it as God's Word. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul would write, For this cause we also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They had received the Word of God, but he says you received it not as the Word of man, but as it is in truth, it's the Word of God. That's the way you received it. That's the way we re need to receive God's Word. The Bible, the Scriptures, truly are from God. When Jesus came to this world, He came with an all-authoritative word that came directly from the Father. He continued to state over and over that His words were not from Him, but they were of the Father. They came from their source of... Uh, the source of those words were from the Father. John 12 and verse 49 sets that forth very clearly. 
The things which I say unto you, they're not mine, but they're all of the Father. And thus what I say and what I speak, not from me, but they're from the Father. Thus Jesus came with that all authoritative word, but he gave that word to his apostles. In John the 17th chapter, Jesus was setting forth his prayer, the Lord's prayer. He prayed first for himself, then for his apostles, and then for all those who would believe on him through their word. But in that middle section when he's praying for his apostles, three times, verse 8, verse 14, and verse uh, 17, he tells them that I am sending them into the world with thy word. The world's going to reject them, but it's going to be because they're rejecting that word. And so he did so, we find, in, by John chapter 14, verse 25 and 26, and John 16, verses 12 and 13, that he did so by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was going to be coming to the apostles. He would guide them into all truth. He would show them things to come. He would bring to their remembrance all things that Jesus had said. And as a result, that which they spoke was truly the word of God, not the word of man. It didn't originate with man. And thus, Jesus could tell his apostles, for example, in Mark 13 and verse 11, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. Neither be, do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is going to be speaking through them. It's not their word. Thus, they don't have to study it. They don't have to premeditate and think beforehand in relationship to how they're going to answer someone. And this is specifically in reference to when they deliver you up to the leaders. The leaders are going to question you. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You don't have to think beforehand the answers that are going to come. It's going to be given you right then and there by the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit speaking through you. And thus, when they spoke, they spoke not their own word, but the word of the Father. In 2 Peter 1, in verse 21, while it's dealing specifically with the Old Testament, yet the New Testament application is just as true when he says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It didn't come, it did not originate with these men, these great prophets of the Old Testament. It didn't originate with them. It wasn't their word. They were being, and the word moved there is literally the word carried along. They were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Now, and that principle is seen likewise in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and I realize we won't, don't have time to go through the entire chapter, but it would be a profitable study because he's contrasting the will of God versus and the wisdom of God versus the foolishness of man. And Paul was saying at the very beginning, what I preach is not my word, but it's a word that came from God. The wisdom of God is what I'm preaching. And it did not come into the thought, into the mind of, of man Man would not know it. The things that God has prepared for them that love Him, and those that love Him specifically there are dealing with context as the apostles. But notice verse 10. But God hath revealed it unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. He then gives in verse 11 an illustration of the principle that he just set forth. What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him. 
Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Man could not know the very nature, the very ideas, the thoughts of God. Couldn't do it on our own. It's amazing how man tries to do it today, though because they ignore God's Word, and they think that God will accept certain things instead of going by what God has revealed. They think that they know God's mind and what God will be pleased with instead of what God has revealed by the Spirit. But they don't know God's mind. No one on their own would know God's mind. But, going back to verse 10, it was revealed. God revealed His mind to the apostles by the Spirit. Notice verse 12 thus. Now we, the we is again talking about the apostles, have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things? What things? The things that God has revealed to them by the Spirit. Which things also we speak? Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Thus, here's the apostles. They had received the Holy Spirit. God was revealing to them that the thoughts that God has, the thoughts that God wanted us to know, He revealed them to us, or to the apostles, by the Spirit. They then spoke those words. It wasn't the ideas and the thoughts and the words of man. It was verily the words of God. Not in words that man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. And thus, they compared spiritual things with, and I know that the word isn't there, but it's spiritual words. Here's the words, the spiritual words. What are those spiritual words? It's those words that came from the Father, through, this, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And they were speaking those words. And thus they could compare spiritual things. What is right? What is wrong? What does God want in relationship to, the, to our life? They could compare spiritual things with those spiritual words. They know by the spiritual words whether those things are right or whether they're wrong, whether they have their origin in God or whether they only have their origin in man. Thus the apostles were not speaking their own words, but they were speaking, yea, the very, the very words of God Himself. Now then, this is also true in relationship to what they wrote. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 2 specifically states in relationship to the words which they spoke. Does it apply to what they wrote as well? Well, we find out that it does. In 2 Thessalonians 2, in verse 15, Paul would say, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. The word tradition, by the way, is very simply that which has been handed down does not deal with the source of that which has been handed down. Now we know that that which has been handed down to the apostles came, it was handed down from God by the Holy Spirit. Thus, the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word, well, that's what we just noticed in 1 Corinthians 2. The words which they spoke. How did it come? by the Spirit revealing to them, the apostles, the very words dealing with the mind of God. Whether you've been taught by word or our epistle. And thus now Paul joins with those words of 1 Corinthians 2, that which they wrote, the epistles that they wrote. When we go to Ephesians, the third chapter thus... 
and verses 3 and verse 4. Paul would say that how, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now in the mystery, as you, if you continue in the third chapter, is dealing with the salvation of man by Jesus Christ. And that salvation of man being all men, whether you're dealing with Jew or Gentile, doesn't make any difference. How that all men will be saved through Jesus Christ. God revealed that to Paul. How did he do it? By the Holy Spirit, giving him those words by which he was to speak. But now then, he says that that revelation was made known unto me, the mystery, how as I wrote a four in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So the Holy Spirit, God, through the Holy Spirit, was giving unto Paul, and by the way, a study of 1 Corinthians chapter, or Galatians chapter 1, and verses uh, 10 through verse 12 would be a good study in, along that line, that his, that which he spoke was not, he didn't receive it of man, that it, it was revealed directly from God to him. Now then, when he spoke that word, it was God's word as revealed by the Holy Spirit. But now then, I wrote it, Paul says. Now God revealed it to me. I wrote it. And 1 Corinthians 2, he spoke it. And when we, you and I read what Paul wrote, I can understand. I have the exact same understanding that Paul himself had. Paul's came by direct revelation from God, by the Holy Spirit. He wrote it down, and I can read it, I can understand it, which a lot of brethren now are denying that we can understand Oh, it, it might mean the same thing to this person and something totally different to this person and something totally opposite to another person. They all must be right. We can't say that anybody is wrong because we can't really know what it says. Well, that's false. Paul is saying, you can understand the exact same knowledge that I have and that I receive by revelation. You receive it by reading what I wrote. I received it directly from God as revealed by the Holy Spirit. But it's exactly the same. Now, I might misunderstand it. You might misunderstand it. But we cannot understand it correctly and, ha and come a away with two different views. It's going to be the same. There might be a change or a difference in depth of understanding. I might have a greater depth of understanding. I better have a greater depth of understanding than I had 20 years ago. But that doesn't change the understanding. It is a depth, a greater understanding. But the understanding was the same. And thus, Paul would write in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The scripture, the writings, literally. And that includes Paul's writings. They're given by, and it's one word in the Greek, even though translated inspiration of God with three words, but it's one word, and literally it is God-breathed. They come from the very breath of God Himself, as revealed by the Spirit. We need to receive the Bible, the scriptures, as it is in truth, the Word of God. But being the Word of God, it demands our utmost respect and reverence. 
God is not, in His Word, simply making an optional request of things. That it doesn't really matter whether you do it or whether you don't do it. It is something that He sets forth that is mandatory. They are rules. It is referred to as the law of Christ because it is a law by which we must live. Not something that is optional that just doesn't matter one way or the other. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21, while Paul is dealing with the aspect of trying to save everyone, he says to those that are without law, as without law. But then he puts this qualifier on there, lest anyone should misunderstand what he's saying. Being not without law of God, or to God, but under the law of Christ, the law to Christ, that I may gain them that are without law. So I'm trying to save those who are without law. He's dealing specifically with the Gentile world there as they were not given the written oracles of God in the Old Testament. They had, the Jews had the law of Moses. It was a written codified law. Gentiles didn't have such. And so he's using that phrase, with, I'm trying to save those of the Gentile world, those who were without the law of Moses, and I become like unto them. But lest you misunderstand, you're not without law, because we're all under the law to Christ. Christ has given us a law. That is something that is mandatory, something that we must do. This is how we must live. James in chapter 1, verse 25 and 26, or 25, says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth, Therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What is it? He looks into the Scriptures, that which finds their origin in God. It is a perfect law of liberty. But it being a law, it's not something that is optional for us one way or the other. It's something that is mandatory that we must do. And so he mentions, we continue therein. We continue in that law. That law is not something that we pick up one day and then we can ignore it the rest of the week. It's not something that we do, oh, Sunday morning, but we don't have to do it Sunday afternoon or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or so forth. We have to continue in that law. Not be a forgetful hearer. In other words, we hear the law, but it doesn't really make any effect to us in our lives. We leave from that place or this place of worship where we worship God and study His Word, and we go out into a world and we forget about what we've heard. And we don't live according to it. A forgetful hearer. But instead, we must be a doer of the work the work that God has set forth for us to do. We must be that doer, not just a hearer. And it's the doer of the word or the work that is blessed in his deeds because he's doing that which God has required us to do. The 19th Psalm in verse 7, David would write that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It converts the soul. It changes that person who lived for self, who, yes, said as the song said that we sang, all of self and none of thee. It changes that person to be that person in that last verse that says, none of self and all of thee. It has converted the soul. And we need to remember that that word, not our thoughts, not our ideas, 
not our wishful thinking, not based upon how we live, but that word which God gave through the apostles to us, that's what's going to judge us in the last day. John the 12th chapter and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. How do we have God, Christ's words today? Because the apostles, being guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote those words down for us, and we have them today. And thus he that rejects those words hath one that judgeth him the words that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. We're going to be on that last day. Notice, this is the last day, not the last days. Last days, plural, deals with the Christian dispensation. The last day, though, means there's no more days. That's the end. And if you want to see what's going to happen at the end of time, that last day, then go over to 2 Peter, the third chapter, and you'll see that this world and all of the elements will be destroyed, will be burned up. It will cease to exist. And you and I, every person who has ever lived, will stand before Christ and will be judged by the words that He has set forth. And thus, Romans, the second chapter and verse 16, Paul would say, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And what was His gospel? It was that gospel which the Father had given to Him by direct revelation of the Holy Spirit, and which He has written down for us, and we can now read and understand when we read such. And we can live according to it. Receive it, yes, as the, it is in truth the Word of God. But then second, we need to receive the Word with meekness. James 1 and verse 21, James says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Notice that, receive with meekness. The word meekness is from a Greek word praetis. And the word deals with the idea of having strength, but that strength has been brought under control. It was used of horses, wild horses, that were tamed. They didn't lose their strength, but the strength that they had was now able to be controlled. And thus it deals with the idea of submission. A submission to the will, in the horse's case, the will of the rider. As he would guide the horse one way or the other, and thus he's under the control of of the rider, even though he has not lost his strength, his power. That's the idea of this word meek. Someone who is brought under the control, who will, in our case, willingly submits our will to the will of God. You receive with meekness the implanted or the engrafted word. Here's the Word of God, and we willingly submit ourselves to that Word, realizing that it is that Word that is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here's God's power to save. What is it? It's that written message, the, the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while, as Paul would say, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, he goes on to say, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That power to save is found within the Word of God, and thus we've got to be obedient to it. We've got to do what it says. But first, in order to do that, we have to learn that Word. Paul would say in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we've got to hear that Word and we have to then accept that Word. We have to receive that Word and receive it with meekness where we will submit ourselves to that Word of God. 
Paul would write in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study the word. Why? Because it is through that word which faith comes. And it is through that word that's going to save us if we humbly submit ourselves to that will. And thus, after learning it, we we must submit ourselves to it. In Romans 6 and verse 17 and verse 18, Paul would say, But God be thanked that you were, here's their former life, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. There's that humble submission, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, the form of teaching. What were they teaching? They were teaching that Word of God that they spoke and that they wrote down. Well, you were the servants of sin. You obeyed from the heart that form of teaching, that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. So you were the servants of sin, but now then you're freed from that sin, and you became the servants of righteousness. Why? Because you have humbly submitted yourself freely to that will that is revealed that is revealed within the pages of the New Testament. And thus, as the Hebrews writer would state in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The very idea of obedience and obeying him is that idea of humbly submitting ourselves to the will of Christ that has been revealed to us in the Word of God, the Bible. If you've not willingly submitted yourself to that Word, we would encourage you this morning to obey that Word of God and then not be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. So if you've never obeyed that Word, do so this morning. Through your faith, repent of your sins, make the confession of your faith that you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us baptize you in water because in that act of baptism you're changing your state from that state of lostness, that state of being a servant of sin, you being now freed from that sin. But then if you haven't become that servant of righteousness, if you were that forgetful hearer, and not a doer of the work, then why not repent of your sins and come back unto Him this morning? Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of those sins so that you can have, and as James says, you can be blessed in your work. You'll hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, when we stand before Christ, and we'll be able to enter into that eternal home with God in heaven. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.